I've been getting this nagging feeling that I need to um, I need to do this one. I hope I can do it quickly. I don't know. I want to or I'm hearing that uh, though I have attempted to do up a a family history book for each one of my grandchildren um, that there's somebody that's gonna get lost and information and things that I know they're not gonna know and so this is kind of an attempt <laughs> Right now, I'm thinking it's an attempt that I can br try to briefly record nine generations at least that I hold in my head of my of of my ancestors. Um, and so, I will start out to say that uh, uh, as uh, I am my father's only child and my mother's only child and I had three children. I was blessed with three children and um, sadly uh, lost three others in the trying to have those three children. But um, I was born in 1945 within six weeks of the time that the bomb went off. So that's where I began. And uh, my father, uh, his name is Robert. Everyone called him Bob. Um, his, uh, his family line um, is mainly pioneers and outlaws. Uh, he has an ancestor that uh, rode with Jesse James. In fact, served 10 years in the pen over it. And uh, but the money that they had from the bank robberies, the train robberies, and and such that money most of it was never found and though my dad's mom used to quietly tell stories about well if something really came down hard and bad in the family that she could go to um, her grandfather and be able to get a little bit of money um, after he got out of uh, prison, he and his wife came down into the Cherokee Nation and uh, set up, bought him a little farm and, and set up housekeeping. And she, she went to work as a school teacher in Welch, Oklahoma. And um, they had changed their name. Uh, and uh, so on his um, tombstone, his, his name will say that uh, his last name is Ryan, R-Y-A-N. But um, it, uh, it wasn't always. So anyway. That's just a touch of my father's side. I never knew my father. I only spent um, about two weeks in his custody that I know of. And uh, my mother's family and my father's family disliked each other much. They all loved me. 
but they did not like each other at all. And so I spent the first year of my life uh, with my father's family. And then by the time I was 18 months old, uh, a court thing was done and, and the judge ended up giving me to my mother's mother. My mother's name is Jerry, or J. Wee, and uh, her maiden name is Rogers. And her father's name was uh, Earl Jesse Rogers. And her mother's name was uh, Naniha Williams, Nancy Williams. My grandfather, Earl Rogers, um, raised a family. He had two families. His uh, main family was, with several children, had, was um, with his second wife. And um, my grandmother and he just had my mother. His father was um, Lodi Rogers. Lodi Rogers, um, I never knew much about him other than uh, my grandma always said that he was, uh, he was wild. As so was his wife. Um, which her name was uh, uh, Florence Rowena Rogers, and actually, you know, her maiden name was Brown. And uh, so he and her, they were both products of, um, they were born in, in the 1880s, and uh, he died in 47 just a couple of years after I was born. And uh, his wife, Rowena, um, she had went to California then, and she lived to 1966, but I cannot remember ever having seen her. I said she was the wild generation. I did know her mother, and uh, her mother was Lowena, Horn was her maiden name, and she had married George Washington Shipley Brown, who was born in the 1850s in Tennessee and had uh, left home at an early age and went to Texas and became a cowboy and ended up uh, wandering into Collin County, Texas, which was a large settlement of Cherokees, and uh, found uh, uh, Lowena, whose white name was Susan, and uh, they got married. And then when the tribe called and said, no matter where you are on the planet, if you want to continue with your Cherokee citizenship, you need to come back to the 14 counties of the Cherokee Nation here in Oklahoma. And so they sent the word out, and Lowena and uh, George Washington Shipley Brown sat down and discussed it and decided that uh, they were going to come back. So they came to Oklahoma and uh, reaffirmed her citizenship rights and that's why I have an Indian card. There was other members of the family who had nice ranches down there in Collin County, Texas, and they decided that they wasn't going to come back. The The land in Texas at that time was worth $10 an acre. The land up here in Oklahoma uh, was worth $3 an acre. And... Uh, they was going to have to start all over again. They didn't understand 
about the continued generations of citizenship that was going to come out of it all and stuff. So they chose to stay, and their descendants are not legal Cherokee citizens, and fortunately, I am. Um, Lodi Rogers, who is um, my great-grandfather, his father was Samuel Rogers, and he was married, or, or he was married to uh, one of the Tidwell girls, which was kind of famous in the Cherokee Nation. Um, the family had a seedy reputation. Uh, not Margaret, who was my direct you know, second great-grandmother, but um, so her sisters did. And um, so anyway, bypassing that, going ahead and coming on, say, to uh, uh, Rowena Brown, um, who was married to Lodi Rogers. Her mother was Susan Lowena Horn, and they were part of the generation that was in Collin County, Texas. Uh, as I said, the, the Indian family there. Um, the, her father was William Thurnborough Horn, and, and he was uh, a preacher. And uh, the settlement, the Indian settlement that was in Collin County, he was uh, he was thought of to be like the leader of that settlement because being a preacher was, you know, that's the way things were. And he was married to Margaret Jane Ledbetter. Now Margaret Jane Ledbetter was a mixed blood, and her mother her mother was Cynthia Doherty. Uh, who was well respected and well thought of in the tribe and because of the, the Doherty line. And uh, her father was David Ledbetter, who was a white man. Now, Cynthia was the daughter of James Doherty Jr., which is a real, you know, he. He was, um, he had quite a reputation. He was very well known. Um, and uh, so was his father, James Doherty Sr. James Doherty Sr. fell in love with a white woman. She was a white captive, and we've never known what her name was. She's always was known as the white captive the wife of James Doherty. Um, he had traded um, all of the things that he had received from the white men in a in a treaty that they had done. Oh, they done that treaty in about like 1818 or something like that and and he was there and they gave everybody different things, and he received these things called gorgets. And so when he was returning back to his village, he came across a uh, camped settlement of uh, a, a band of Creek Indians. Now, we fought the Creek Indians for 500 years, and but when you met each other out on the road like that, that wasn't the time for war. And so they invited him to come into their camp, and he did. And, and they all was enjoying uh, gambling. There was a game that they were playing. And so my grandfather, James Doherty, he sat down and joined in on this. Um, and he saw in the around the camp there that there was a woman that was tied up, and then they had cut her loose and was treating her quite badly, and 
having her come serve them stuff or bring bring something or another over to them and stuff. And um, he thought she was very pretty. And so in the evening of gambling, he ended up betting all that he had that um, for her. And he ended up winning her. He was a mixed blood. His dad was Cornelius Doherty, uh, which was rather famous. And um, his mother was, her. she was a full blood that was Aniwaki. Awinaki is, um, she was a very fine lady is about all I know about her. She was very Gentile, uh, you know, very gentle and stuff. Well, anyway, he is a half-breed. He ended up getting this white captive girl. And both of them was born right around 1750. And he died in 1818. But in that period of time, he did not take her as a slave. He took her as a wife and uh, treated her respectfully. And she gave him the son, James Jr. Um, James, um, she was always wanting for him to give her permission or to let her go and to let her return to her people who were in, from Virginia. And, uh, but he knew that if he did, he wouldn't, you know, probably ever see her again. And though at the time, the relationships between the whites, the, the Virginia whites and the Cherokee, you know, which their, their kingdoms was separated by a river. Um, they had, um, uh, they had settled and was no longer physically fighting one another, but things weren't good between them. They was, the Cherokees was very much not appreciated in the white community and, and vice versa. Um, but so eventually, uh, when her son was about seven, eight years old, she kept asking him and kept asking him to let her cross the river and go see her folks and just, you know, be gone for one moon. She'd leave on the full moon. She'd be back on the full moon and she'd have a chance to have seen her family and, and everything. And so he finally gave in. He did that. And so she went down and he went down at, to the river and, uh, his son, James, was there, and so she and, and little James crossed the river, and he, she went over into the white man land. He waited there. He waited there the whole month, and then the month was up, and she didn't come back. And so he waited for another month there by the water. And she never came back. And he was a mixture of anger and heartbroken and knew he had, shouldn't have done it and, you know, was angry and stormed back up to the village where they lived and proceeded to take two wives, two full-blood Indian wives, and he had just had enough of, you know, the white men. And... Uh, so anyway, the part of the story that he didn't know was that when his wife, the white captive, when she went back to where her family was, she had went to where the minister's house was and where the church was. And they had quickly got in contact with her family, who was just appalled at the fact that she was still alive. Any decent white woman would have killed herself rather than been the wife of of, uh, of an Indian. And here she was. She had this half-breed child in tow. And so her family took her 
and sent her far back east. We never knew where. And they took the little boy, little James Jordy Jr., and put him in a church-driven, like, orphanage. And he was there in that orphanage for the next nine years of his life until he turned 18. And uh, he had kept remembering about what his life was like when he was uh, living in the Cherokee Nation, how free it was, and how all of these pompous rules that was being inflicted upon him there, uh, the beatings and, and the way that these uh, missionaries was treating him and stuff. Uh, he really missed the, the way of the Indians. And so about the time that he got up to about the age of 18, uh, he crawled out the window and he left and found his way back to the Cherokee Nation, back to his father's family. And so there he was, all happy in the Cherokee Nation, and his mom was long gone and nobody knew where she was. His dad was remarried to somebody else, but you know, little James had all grown up, and he kept thinking about this girl that was there in that orphanage, too. And so he decided he was going to go back to the white man land. He was going to cross that river again. He was going to sneak back in there and see if he could see her. So he snuck back across the line. He went back to where the orphanage was and stuff. And he found her out working in the fields. And he snuck up and he talked to her. And he said, if I, I don't want to live here. If, would you come with me? back to the Cherokee Nation and to live your life as my wife. She thought about it for a little bit, not too long. She says, yes, I would, because I don't like it here either. So that evening, she snuck out, and he and her took off, and they returned to the Cherokee Nation. And her name was Mary Elizabeth, and they all called her Polly. And her last name was Dean. Later on, we found out that she was the child of a William Dean and a female named Pauline. That was all that she could remember of who her parents had been. But um, so James Doherty Jr. and Mary Elizabeth Pauline Dean had a daughter named Cynthia Doherty. And they had, this had started out and took place in Hightower. Um, Hightower, it was in Georgia. And they lived their, their life there. Uh, James Jr., he died at the age of 60. And uh, they had had a, a good life. Uh, Mary Dean, she, Doherty, she ended up living to the age of 78 and uh, died in what became Dawson County, Georgia. But Cynthia, <clears throat> Cynthia Doherty, their daughter, is my fourth great grandfather, granddaughter, or grandmother. And so James Doherty Jr is my fifth great-grandfather and James Doherty Sr. Uh, was my sixth great-grandfather and his father was Cornelius Doherty which was for the most part the first white man to come into the Cherokee Nation. He was born in Scotland and he was quite the rebel. He had been put on a boat by the King of England and deported to the colonies um, for being a rebel rouser and fighting for Scotland to be free from England. And they had caught him a couple of times and he'd got away and stuff and they wasn't going to mess with him anymore so they just put him on a boat and sent him to Americas. Cornelius said when he got off that boat the only thing he saw every place he looked was red coats. And he had just, you know, for him, that was the enemy. And so he just started walking west. He didn't know where he was going. And 
where he ended up finding himself was in the Cherokee Nation. He had walked right out of the area that was controlled by the English and right into the Cherokee Nation. And so he was camped out there and the Cherokees came around and said, hi, you know, what you doing here in our nation and stuff. And he says, well, I want to figure out how I can live here because I really don't like them guys over there across the river. So they explained it to him that the only way that he could live in their nation was to be a citizen of their nation. And the only way he could do that was he had to marry an Indian woman. And the only way he could do that was he had to be known. He had to live there for a little while. He needed to be known by the Indians. And he had to be able to have seven Cherokees stand up and say he was a good guy and he was somebody worthy of marrying the Indian girl. And so that's what he did. He lived out by himself at the edge of our nation and stuff until, but he was trapping and hunting and uh, getting the, the Cherokee boys to, uh, to hunt with him. And uh, he was bringing something to them that they didn't understand about. And that was trade, trade with the white people over across the river and stuff. And so he would load up all of the furs that they had got together and stuff through a, through a season and stuff. And he took them all over to the white man side and to a place that was called Charles City. Uh, later became Charleston. And uh, so he would end up trading for all kinds of things that he knew that would really be beneficial in the Cherokee Nation. Pots and pans and cookware and and you know, of course, blankets and traps and guns and all that kind of stuff. And so he lived his long life um, in the Cherokee Nation. And we guessed that he was born about 1720. And uh, he died about 1780 um, there in the Cherokee Nation. And, and he set in on all of the treaties that the whites was trying to do with the Indians and he could understand and he could translate for them and so many was the time that he is going no nah, you ain't gonna no nah, we ain't gonna go for that and he would explain to the Indians why that wasn't a good thing for them to trade the the whites was always trying to just get a little bit more land a little bit more land you know uh, maybe a, a hunting area that we had and so that's a little bit of the family. And um, that goes back nine generations from me, but that was the seven generations of my grandfather. And I enjoyed lesson, listening and, and hear him tell the stories about that. It was through Cornelius Doherty that red hair came into our family. And my grandfather ended up having red hair and and though you know though his mother was dark-skinned Indian and stuff that red hair just kept popping straight back up again and my mother ended up having the red hair and my son has that same red hair so that's a little bit about the history and the family and um, I hope uh, you enjoyed it and I hope that this is a, a nice little evening time walk down memory lane through history because when am I going to tell you this when am I going to tell my descendants this? we don't have an old cellar anymore that we all go to and that you all can cuddle around and I can tell you stories to keep you from being scared of the thunder and um, bless be.